Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. In this episode, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Larry Chapp to discuss Hans Urs von Balthasar's Love Alone is Credible. Dr. Larry Chapp is a retired professor of theology. He taught for 20 years at DeSales University. He received his doctorate from Fordham University in 1994 with a specialization in the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar. He is the editor, along with Dr. Rodney Hauser, of How Balthasar Changed My Mind. Fifteen scholars reflect on the meaning of Balthasar for their own work. In 2013, he and his wife opened the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm in Harvey Lake, Pennsylvania. He's also the founder and editor of the popular Catholic blog site, Gaudium et Spes 22. In Hans Urs von Balthasar's masterwork, The Glory of the Lord, the great theologian used the term theological aesthetic to describe what he believed to be the most accurate method of interpreting the concept of divine love, as opposed to approaches founded on historical and scientific grounds. In Love Alone is Credible, von Balthasar delves deeper into this exploration of what love means, what comprises the divine love of God, and how we must become lovers of God in the footsteps of saints like Francis de Sales, John of the Cross, and Therese of Lisieux. Love Alone is Credible brings a fresh perspective on an off-explored subject. This scholarly work is a deeply insightful and profound theological meditation that serves to both deepen and inform the faith of the believer. With Dr. Larry Chapp, we now begin our conversation on Love Alone is Credible. Welcome, Larry. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So blessed, I'd say, for myself to have you to talk to about Love Alone is Credible by Hans Urs von Balthasar. It's an extraordinary yeah. book, and it's one that you know very well. Yeah, it's a book that changed my life. I mean, I can share with your listeners a, a personal story. When I was an undergraduate, I was an undergraduate seminary, and uh, I was a firebrand, fire-breathing, heretic-hunting conservative who read this periodical all the time called The Wanderer. I don't know if you're familiar with oh, it. Oh, sure. Just, just, early neo-traditionalist stuff. And man, I was just on fire. And But I gradually started to get very dissatisfied with all of that. And because I was, you know, intellectually oriented and stuff, my spiritual director was a guy named Father Anton Morgenroth, who was a convert from Judaism, and he had fled Germany uh, to escape Hitler. And he actually knew von Balthasar. So I was having spiritual direction with him one day, and uh, I was sharing with him my concerns over the manualist kind of neo-scholastic drivel that I was getting in my philosophy courses. And he patiently listened. He said, okay, our time's up. And I got up to leave and he went to his bookshelf and he said, wait one minute. And he pulled love, a copy of Love Alone off his shelf and he literally threw it at me across the room. And I caught it startled. He goes, here, read that. It will make you less stupid. <laughs> 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 and I did. And it changed my life. It completely changed my life. So it's actually the very first book of his that I read. And actually, it's the first book, really, I had read of any of the resource moth, Nouvelle Theologie guys, you know. I was reading guys like Gary Gou Lagrange and stuff like that. And so reading Love Alone opened me not only to Balthazar, but to De Lubac and, you know, Congar and all of these guys, Guardini, people I had never heard of before, and it actually just lit me on fire. And I've been lit on fire ever since. And I ended up doing my doctoral dissertation on Balthazar at Fordham University in the late 90s, or late 80s and early 90s. 
uh, which was a bastion of Ronarian dogmatism. And so I, I did not always have easy going there. Um, so I was actually very heartened when I was, I'm reading, I'm way off topic now, but no. I was reading the current, this biography out by Peter Seewald on Pope Benedict, mm -hmm. Joseph Ratzinger. And it really consoled me when I read that he actually had great difficulty getting his dissertation passed because he was opposed by a very powerful theologian named Michael Schmaus, who thought Ratzinger was a dangerous modernist. And so his habilitation, the Germans essentially have to write two dissertations. So his second one was razor thin passage because of Schmaus's opposition. So had Ratzinger not had his habilitation thesis passed, we may never have ever heard of Joseph Ratzinger. So it gives me consolation, though, that the opposition I met at Fordham that, I, you know, this is stock in trade stuff for academics. They, they hate each other. <laughs> so you know, they don't they don't take to disagree. Anyway, I'm off topic. Let's get back on topic. Well, I think you bring up a very important point, though. I mean, for let's just say the the average layman like myself who is um, hasn't been called to that deeper theological pursuit, that being able to understand the currents that are happening within the church, we're surface dwellers on the sea. But there are currents that happen in moving us all towards the ultimate goal, I suppose. And right. what happens in those halls, within those conversations, those dynamics on that theological level can affect us in many ways, can it? Oh, it really can affect people. Uh, and there is you know, a, a lot of what goes on in arcane theological disputes remain simply arcane and in the theological world. But there's absolutely an impact this stuff has. I mean, the Second Vatican Council is a living testimony to the effectiveness of these like arcane disputes over the nature of nature and grace between de Lubac and Lagrange and, and people like that. Debates that if the average layperson were to simply pick up de Lubac's book, Sua Natural, on nature and grace, they wouldn't have the faintest idea what in the heck was at stake here. What, what is the issue here? Mm -hmm. Why do we care that the neo-scholastics had a two-tiered vision of nature and grace that were loosely connected with each other, whereas de Lubac had a more holistic vision of that relationship? Why does that matter? Well, it matters greatly when you unpack its full implications for the life of the church. And that is the effect that reading Love Alone had on me. I like I said, was this very conservative sort of heretic hunting, hyper magisterialist. You know, I was one of these, I was, you know, in seminary during the heyday of the silly season after Vatican II. And so I definitely sided with one side of that debate over the other. And I blamed the liberals for everything. And if we could just get back to the church before Vatican II, everything would be great. It would be great. But some, the point is I spent a lot of time trying to, in a sense, is, I guess you, the word you would use is apologetics. I was constantly doing apologetics, trying to prove this, trying to prove that. And so when I read Love Alone, it was obviously, you know, it's not a simple book. It's, it's, it starts off simply, but then gets dense. And so for, for an undergraduate, as I like to say, for me, learning from it was like trying to drink out of a fire hose you know, get a drink of, to sip water out of a fire hose. It was just a rush. And I, just, I was trying to get as much as I could. But what I got from it, all right, is that the attempt to justify Christ via either cosmology or anthropology, some sort of philosophical or theological or scientific foundation that you then build Christ out of, that is a deeply flawed approach because what inevitably happens, according to Balthazar, is you end up reducing Christ to each one of those sorts of foundations. So you end up with the, the anthropological tail wagging the Christological dog. All right, so it's all well and good, as you see with the early church fathers, where they developed the logos theology and said, okay, Christ is the overriding logos that governs everything. And then there are all these little logoi all right, out there in the universe, and the pagan gods cannot tie all of that up into a nice, neat little ribbon. Even the Platonic scheme can't quite do this, or the Plotinian scheme can't quite do this. 
Only the logos of God, Christ, can do that. Now, that's actually true, all right? There's nothing wrong with that on one level. But what Balthazar points out was that the church fathers would often then try to, in a sense, fit Christ into that cosmological framework. So what happens when a hierarchical cosmology that views stars and planets as angels and the music of the spheres and the perfection of all that, what happens when a scientific cosmology emerges and all of that goes away? In fact, that's kind of what was at stake in so many ways mm -hmm. with the debate with Galileo. It, 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 what was shocking to church people, it's always misconstrued as it was a disagreement over scripture, 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 scriptures say the earth is flat. You had Jesuits and, and Dominicans long before Galileo and long before Copernicus surmising that the earth was a sphere, that it, you know, it may not be the center of the universe and so on. What actually shocked people more than anything with Galileo's telescope was that when you looked at the moon, it was gross. I mean, it was this cratered, pockmarked, horrible looking thing that was clearly not an angelic projection of perfection. Uh, and you also then began to notice that the orbits were not perfectly circular. They were more elliptical and could be irregular. So this was the overturning of an Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmology. And this is Balthazar's point that when you overturn that cosmology, if your Christology is rooted in that, then your Christology gets disassembled and is called into question. Likewise, if you're going to root Christ, and this is the next section of the book, he starts with the cosmological stuff. The next section of the book deals with, okay, that cosmology is gone. Now we need to root Christ in some kind of um, anthropology where you seek out in the structures of human consciousness and moral awareness, what the philosophers call the conditions of possibility for a revelation in the first place. And that too, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, even De Lubach, even both of the resource Mont guys do a sophisticated anthropological analysis to see in what ways we can be actually, as Rahner called it, hearers of the word. Because if there is no point of contact between God and us, no analogy, no capacity within us for hearing God's word, then we wouldn't hear God's word. So there is a certain truth in this anthropological quest. But then, of course, as we see, in, beginning with liberal Protestantism, but then emerging in Catholic modernism, with the immanentism of people like Blondel, you begin to see Christ reduced to the structures of human consciousness, such that then you end up with very low Christologies in the 20th century, where, where the hypostatic union essentially is called into question, and Christ simply now is portrayed as the sort of most ingraced, more, most maxed out Human, human being who ever lived. He fulfills all of those psychological categories of a man who has perfect God consciousness and this sort of thing. But well, that's not orthodox Christology, obviously. There you have an anthropology that is governing your Christology. And so Balthazar is at pains to point out that of course a logos theology or an anthropological analysis, all of that is legitimate, but you cannot use that as, a, a, to use a fancy word here, a propedeutic, which is to say, you cannot wait to do Christology until all of your foundational philosophical points have been made. Christ's revelation has to be credible in itself. There has to be something self-justifying. After all, the word theology means theologi, it means God speak. But it's not us speaking about God, it is God speaking about God. That the hermeneutic of the New Testament is that God is interpreting himself for us in this towering figure of Christ, who is sui generis in a sense, who is unique. And even though there are analogical points of contact with our humanity, there is also a sense in which Christ bursts the categories, bursts those wineskins of our, so it fulfills us even as it destroys and ruptures us and smashes us open into something new. This is one of the reasons too why Balthazar was opposed to Taylor de Chardin because he believed that Chardin made the transition from humanity to Christ too smooth. There is no rupture. There is no, there's no rattling of the cage, so to speak. So that's in a sense the schema of love. A love that's why it's Glaubhaft ist nur Liebe. Love alone is credible.
that it is what makes the towering figure of Christ self-authenticating, self-justifying, is that is it is the unsurpassable revelation of love in its essence, in its core. Now, here is where I think Balthazar could be open to criticism, open to question, and it's certainly a question that I asked, which is, what if you don't see it? What if you just don't see this? You know, it's like Balthazar loved Mozart. I mean, the story is told where, you know, he, he at one point in his life, he got rid of his records, his Mozart records and everything, because he had them all memorized in his head. He could just listen to the whole thing in his head. He was a genius after all. Mm -hmm. um, and so he often uses the analogy of art to say art is self-authenticating. And Christ is, that's why he wrote a theological aesthetic, you know, art is self-authenticating. You don't develop a propedeutic to establish why this art is, is really art. No, the art itself speaks to you. The art itself sees you. And that's all true. But there's also a sense in which there has to be, in the eye of the beholder, the ability to see that. And that is actually this, then the second part of his first volume of his theological aesthetics is where he, he develops this notion of seeing. That's why volume one of the aesthetics is called seeing the form. It's, it's more, it's not enough that the form is there. It also has to provoke something from within us. Balthazar's approach only works, therefore, with people who have the spiritual capacity to see which I think accounts for why so many people reject his approach. They view it as a kind of Catholic Bartianism, a kind of fideism almost, where, well, you just have to believe because it's so beautiful. That's not it. You have to have the eyes to see it. And a lot of people just don't. A lot of people, even theologians, are still stuck in an enlightenment mentality that says, no, we have to establish reasons for this before I can accept it. And Balthazar is a dangerous fideist who says you either see it or you don't. Well, it's more complicated. Than that. Anyway, that's my little introduction to the book, as meandering as that was. No, I think it was uh, very important for us to kind of have the larger picture, because to understand the book is to also know the destination of where he's taking us with the book. And just yes. like you said, from that moment of reason to what would almost seem unreasonable when a small 20 something Carmelite nun who no one knew about at her death would become a doctor of the church by the end right. of the century. And that's what he's leading us to are figures like that to John of the cross, to Francis de Sales, to Augustine, who all have a different way of experiencing what you just said. And it's mysterious it's really an entering yes. into mystery. And that's where Balthazar wants us to go eventually, doesn't he? Yes. Uh, lacking in my introduction is something also that Balthazar is known for. Quite frankly, I can't remember if he mentions it in Love Alone, but I, I'm pretty sure he does somewhere. I reread the book for this interview, but that was like a week ago now. My 62-year-old my brain isn't what it used to be. But he mentions you know, that all theology has to be on its knees. All valid theology has to be theology and prayer, theology on its knees. In fact, he, he, he is critical of scholastic uh, theology after Aquinas. Uh, uh, he's written this great little essay called The Fathers, the Scholastics, and, and Us. And what he points out is that there was a tremendous change in theology when theology ceased being primarily rooted in the monasteries, in the era of the fathers, almost all theology came from monks and monastic types and so on. It shifted from the monastery, the locus of theology shifted from the monastery to the university in the medieval world. And scholasticism is born. Now he loves Aquinas, he quotes Aquinas more than anybody. But he also notes there was a downside to what Aquinas did, which was to rationalize theology in a sense. Now, I'm Thomas was not a rationalist, and he's not the father of all modern rationalist evils, as like the Eastern Orthodox would claim. Uh, but nevertheless, there was post-Aquinas a rationalism that began to enter in. And so theology came to be viewed as more of an uh, academic discipline than, mon than a monastic one. And so the context of prayer and mysticism was lost. And so that's why it bothers us. Theology has to be 
once again, mystical. One of the problems, uh, even with someone like a Jacques Maritain in, in the 20th century and many theologians and the philosophers in the 20th century, is that they viewed th there was a sort of hyper magisterialism in the air, post Reformation, post Enlightenment, a sort of hypertrophy of the magisterium and magisterial statements. And Maritain and others believed that theology and philosophy in a magisterial note had to have a largely regulative function, that, that the purpose of theology was largely regulative, which is why neo-scholastics was so big on syllogisms, deduction, definitions, clarity. So you could teach seminarians, yada, yada, yada. If a person confesses this, this is your reaction. If you're going to preach on this, this is what you should preach. It was all nicely tied up in a nice neat little ribbon. It had this regulative function. And Balthazar said, no. Theology does not have this regulative function, especially speculative theology. Mysticism is the regulative function because holiness is the only true regulative function in the church. And he wasn't going against truth or the need for magisterial definitions. The last part of his trilogy is the theologic, which is all about truth. But even there, it's an emphasis that the truth is ultimately Christ. It's Pontius Pilate in front of Christ. What is truth? And there's truth standing in front of him. Uh, and therefore, all, even all philosophy is ultimately rooted in a meditation on this deep, deep mystery that is Christ, which has been eclipsed, whereas Christ has been domesticated. And the upshot of all, you talked earlier about what are some of the implications of theology. When theology is merely scholastic and regulative, Holiness kind of gets lost when, when, when the idea is that the regulative theology of the church is not grounded in prayer, not grounded in mysticism, not grounded in the holiness and the mystery of Christ, then it, what is it grounded in? It's grounded in something other than that. And that has a trickle-down effect in, into the church itself. And, uh, and so, yeah, Balthazar, of course, loved Teresa of Lisieux, uh, and he actually left the Jesuits in order to start a secular institute with this Protestant woman that he helped to convert to Catholicism, who was a visionary and a mystic. And a, so, yeah, Balthazar was, you know, he was actually offered professorates in German universities and he turned them all down. I think he was offered a professor at Tübingen, even Tübingen, which was like the epicenter of everything. He said, no, 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 I'm perfectly happy to be a student chaplain and to be the, a writer and, in a sense, the stenographer for this visionary woman, <laughs> Adrienne von Speyer. Uh, who wrote a lot of great books too. So I think one of the great implications of Balthazar's theology for the average lay person is something that shows up eventually in Vatican II, which I think is the central teaching of Vatican II, the universal call to holiness. Business as usual is no longer possible. The laity have to be a leaven in the world. In order to be that Christian leaven in the world, they have to come from a position of prayer, a position of holiness. So as Balthazar wants to point out, even lay people are called to live the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, because they are the fundamental counsels of every, of every baptized Christian. And, uh, and certainly, Teresa of Lisieux was the biggest sort of quiet. Her little way is so, even, you know, I'm a Catholic worker, Dorothy Day loved Teresa of Lisieux. She wrote a little, you know, meditation on Therese. Yeah, it's extraordinary when you think about it, because what Balthazar brings forward is not a Balthazar theology. I think what he's doing, if you look at the big picture, he's expressing something that incredible theologian, popes, leaders of the church, and I'm thinking specifically of John Paul II and oh, yes. Benedict, who have expressed this so clearly in so much of their teaching, everything, what you just described, this theological aesthetic, in essence, he wanted to open the eyes of our hearts so that we could see things in a way that was different. And the, something touched people. It seemed very authentic, very organic, because it caught fire within the church, oh, yes. don't you think? Oh, I agree. There's a, there's a, there's an untranslatable German word. It's called gemütlich, 
And it's a word Germans use. Like I said, it's untranslatable. It just means a deep feeling of happiness or contentedness or joy or well-being. Uh, to feel gemütlich is, is a good place to be. And I often tell people that one of the things that moved me as I read Balthazar for the first time was I felt gemütlich. And I think a lot of people are that way. They don't always understand everything he, he says or writes, but there's something in what he writes and how he writes it that lights your soul on fire, that touches you deeply and just gives you this deep, deep feeling that there is truth in here. He mentions in Love Alone that it's actually uh, a follow-up to an earlier book called Raising the Bastions. And that was written during a time, like I said, when the neo-scholastic edifice was still in place. The Holy Office was still with its forbidden index of books. And, you know, it was, it was, an, or it was still an era of anti-modernist repression and so on. And so Balthazar made it clear in his book, Raising the Bastions, was that this notion of a church as a fortress to hold out everything modern, a fortress inside of which nothing ever changes, everything is defined perfectly, because that bastion has to be destroyed, because that is not the church of Christ. The church of Christ is an evangelizing church, a church that goes out of itself, a church that takes risks. Uh, a, a church that is rooted in mysticism and mystery and not necessarily one clarifying definition after another. So I think the two parts of this puzzle as to why folks like John Paul and Benedict were so deeply moved by Balthazar is because they too were of that generation and they too shared those exact same feelings. I think especially Carol Wojtyla, who had lived through both Hitler and then Stalin, and then the legacy of Stalinism in, in the Soviet Union. I think he understood extremely well, even though he was some kind of a Thomist, right? So I'm not implicating Thomas here. But I mean, John Paul was into St. John of the Cross. He was into, you know, the ascent to Mount Carmel. He was into that spirituality. And I think that he realized both with his experience in Poland and, and then his experience of this spirituality, that the church was shorting itself, that the church was not taking advantage of the full treasure that was at her disposal, the full resources at her. So there did have to be an element of demolition and then an element of reconstruction. And I think both John Paul and uh, Benedict established this deep friendship with Balthazar because even though they didn't, I don't think Benedict always agreed with Balthazar, but uh, nevertheless, they saw a spark in there that was amazing. I mean, Ratzinger would not have started the journal Communio with Balthazar had he not seen that, and John Paul would not have made him a cardinal. I don't know if it's true. I read somewhere where John Paul apparently once said that Balthazar was his favorite theologian. I don't know if that's an apocryphal story or not. But it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, because John Paul's entire theological edifice, all of his writings are just filled, filled with the spirit of Balthazar. This concludes part one of our conversation with Dr. Larry Chapp discussing Hansers von Balthasar's Love Alone is Credible. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with many other episodes of this particular series, visit bonbalthazar.com. There, too, you can also access numerous audio excerpts from this particular book, along with others from the Balthazar Library. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will consider subscribing to this particular podcast and liking it on whatever platform you may be hearing it on. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about vonbalthazar.com and join us for the next episode of Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. <laughs>